Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. We're continuing our discussion of atomic theory. Uh, last time we were talking a little bit about some of the history behind uh, the early models of the atom. And then we had first began introducing uh, John Dalton as the English schoolmaster who developed the uh, Dalton's atomic theory. And then we talked about the law of conservation of mass. Today we'll be talking about the law of definite composition or definite proportions. And then we'll be looking at the structure of the atom and relating that to Dalton's atomic theory. And we'll look at the subatomic particles in the atom, learn where they're located with respect to modern models of the atom, as well as their charges and masses and how we can relate them to similar for atoms or for isotopes or ions. So that's our goals for today. First of all, let's look at the law of definite proportions and composition. Well, if we're considering the law of definite proportions or composition, we're considering that a compound, if we have the same compound that's formed from a variety of different reactions, or if we find this compound in a variety of different locations on the Earth, if it's the same compound, it should have the exact same proportions of the elements present in nice, simple, whole number ratios of the atoms. It really relates as well to the exact proportions are the same for those elements by mass, which is what they observed first. So if we consider H2O, water, no matter what reaction I might perform that produces water molecules, I will always have the same proportion of hydrogen to oxygen. And we'll be able to observe that by having about uh, the same amount of mass in grams of hydrogen to oxygen every time we produce water molecules. But that's because we have a ratio of two hydrogen atoms to every one oxygen atom. So for example, if I have a combustion reaction of natural gas, this is when methane in natural gas is the main component. Uh, your CH4 is methane. When it combusts with a sufficient enough of oxygen, sufficient amount of oxygen, an excess of oxygen, we're going to end up with complete combustion where we form carbon dioxide and water. Water is going to consist of two hydrogens to every one oxygen. But it doesn't matter how I produce the water, it will still have the same proportions, the two hydrogens to the one oxygen, which we could observe by having the same proportions by mass. Uh, so combustion of gasoline. Now gasoline is really a complex mixture of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are carbon and hydrogen based compounds out there and hydrocarbons are a very common source of fuels in our society from uh, natural gas to propane in our grills uh, to butane in cigarette lighters to the complex mixture of hydrocarbons that we use for different grades of gasoline. I've simplified the reaction for gasoline by considering just one possible component as we're looking at octane here which has a formula C8H18, reacting with sufficient oxygen that we have complete combustion and we form carbon dioxide and water. And as we have water produced here, again, the ratio is still two hydrogens to every one oxygen. So it doesn't matter how I produce the water molecules. I'm still, as I produce that water, if I were to find the ratio by mass or by numbers of atoms, I would still have the same ratio, no matter whether I formed the water from combustion of one fuel like methane or any other fuel, including gasoline or anything else. If that's my product, I'm going to have the same ratio by mass, same ratio with respect to the numbers of atoms in the formula. If we have an acid-base neutralization reaction, let's say we have hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, reacting with a strong base like sodium hydroxide. In an acid-base neutral neutralization reaction, we have two major products. We're going to produce a salt and water. But again, we're getting the same proportion by mass between hydrogen and oxygen, no matter how I formed the water molecules. It doesn't matter which one of these reactions are occurring. It's still the same proportions. So that's a law of definite proportions. So if I ran a reaction and I ended up with a compound that had hydrogen and oxygen in a different ratio by mass, it would indicate that I ha would have a different product. It wouldn't be water molecules. It might be something, let's say, like hydrogen peroxide that could be present if I had a ratio that related to two hydrogens and two oxygens being present in the formula. So that's the law of definite proportions and definite compositions, which supported those types of experimental observations, supported the idea of simple whole number ratios of atoms combining. So this helped lead to uh, Dalton's atomic theory. Now, while we're looking at the law of definite proportions, let's consider that if a particular compound is always composed by the same element in the same fractions by mass, what would we see if we collected water in different states of matter? Or maybe if we collected H2O from different sources in nature, would we have the same masses? 
we would. Uh, if we had water from steam, let's say, coming from your stove as you're heating up water on the stove, that steam that's coming off is still consisting of molecules of H2O, which have a fraction by mass that's 11.19% hydrogen by mass and 88.81% oxygen by mass. We're favoring oxygen because oxygen's mass is greater than that of hydrogen. Uh, if we have H2O in the liquid state, let's say in the pot of water, well it still has the same percent by mass with respect to the, the fractions of hydrogen to oxygen because we still have these simple ratios we're dealing with. If we have it frozen as an ice cube in your freezer, well it's still the same ratio by mass. If we get the water from the Snake River, the Pacific Ocean, if we collect it from an iceberg, if we collect that water in our solar system where it's been frozen somewhere, uh, it's still going to be the same ratio of hydrogen to oxygen by mass if we have the same compound. It doesn't matter that's location, it's still the same ratio by mass. If it's water, it's still two hydrogen atoms to every one oxygen atom. Let's consider another compound. Let's consider calcium carbonate. Now calcium carbonate is used um, in antacids. In nature it's used at, at, by uh, sea animals and seashells. It's been in the past used to produce chalk. Uh, it's present in coral in the ocean. It's a component of marbles out there. So if I'm looking at seashells or the components of marble that might be used to make beautiful statues, well that calcium carbonate always has the same ratio. It doesn't matter whether it's in a piece of chalk or seashell, an antacid that I might be consuming. Uh, in all of those cases it's going to be one calcium atom to one carbon atom to three oxygen atoms. If I look at the, the fractions by mass, it doesn't matter where I find the source of calcium originating from, whether it's a seashell or those marble statues. I'm still going to have a percent by mass that's 40% by mass calcium, 12% by mass carbon, and 48% by mass oxygen, no matter where I'm finding calcium carbonate. Now this could be hidden if it's part of a mixture where there's other compounds mixed with it, but if I have pure calcium carbonate I've isolated, it's always the same ratio ratio by mass and numbers of atoms. So that really that's the law of definite proportions or definite compositions. Now this helped lead John Dalton into developing atomic theory. So there was experimental data that showed that we had this nice whole number ratios uh, that could be occurring with respect to numbers of atoms combining which would relate to supporting the same composition by mass in all these different compounds. And the law of conservation of mass as well supported having atoms present in our compounds. And so John Dalton suggested, okay, these are the postulates of his atomic theory. I want you to learn how to uh, predict these and list them on an exam. I like to ask students on exams to list the postulates of the atomic theory. Uh, well, John Dalton in 1808 published his paper on the atomic theory and the first thing he said in this atomic theory is that all matter consists of exceedingly small indivisible particles, which he's calling atoms. Right? This goes back to Democritus and talking about atomos, indivisible, right? the smallest components of matter. Uh, now he suggested they're indivisible. We actually know better now that the atoms do have smaller components such as subatomic particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. But at this point in time there wasn't experimental evidence for those quite yet. So that changes with the modern model of the atom. Now the second postulate of the atomic theory is that all atoms of a given element are identical both in mass and in their chemical properties. Okay. Now we actually know today that we can have different numbers of neutrons in some of our atoms of an element and that results in having slightly different masses of that element even though their chemical properties are identical. So again he wasn't taking into account the knowledge of isotopes because they didn't have it yet. Okay. He did realize, however, that atoms of different elements have different masses and different chemical properties. So this was the next postulate. For his third postulate, he suggested that atoms are not created or destroyed in chemical reactions. So again, this is the law of conservation of mass he's including in the atomic theory. We're not creating or destroying atoms. We have the same number of atoms before a chemical reaction as we have at the end of the chemical reaction. They've just rearranged to form new compounds. Right? So we've maybe broken bonds and formed bonds in this process, or vice versa. Uh, but in these cases, we still have the same number of atoms before and after. So mass has been conserved. Numbers of atoms have been conserved. And we still uh, 
we still rely on that in modern theories of the atom and chemical reactions. So that's still supported today. Uh, with respect to his fourth postulate of the atomic theory, he said that atoms combine in simple fixed whole number ratios to form compounds. This would result in no matter how we form a compound, if it's the same compound that's forming, we would have fixed ratios by mass occurring. And so this is your law of definite composition or definite proportion. So you can see how he's tying in some of these observations that other scientists have made throughout history. Okay, so now we have the atomic theory. Uh, as I said before, when we suggest that atoms are indivisible, uh, we really aren't considering uh, some of the subatomic particles present. So let's consider some of the subatomic particles present next. So the discovery of subatomic particles can be traced back to J.J. Thompson. He discovered the electron in 1897 by his studies with cathode ray tubes. Now you can imagine that cathode ray tubes are very similar to older fashioned TVs where you basically have a uh, filament that you're applying a voltage to. This is producing a beam of particles. Now he was studying these beams of particles in the cathode ray tubes and as he observed those beams of particles moving through a magnetic field he noticed they would be deflected. Now with the deflection of this beam of particles in the cathode ray tube he had fluorescent material that allowed him to trace their movement. Uh, he was able to determine that they were negatively charged particles and that they were quite low in mass. I would ask that you watch this YouTube video at home that shows you a cathode ray tube and some of the experiments that he was running with the discovery of the electron. Uh, but once he realized that atoms uh, consisted of these small negatively charged particles with very little mass, he developed a new model of the atom which we don't currently accept today. But this was the development of a model beyond John Dalton's atomic theory. He suggested what we he called the plum pudding model of the atom. So Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom suggested, well, we have these negatively charged particles, which he called electrons, that are present in the atom. And we can dislodge these electrons to form positive ions. And in that's occurring, you can get, conduct electricity, you're producing the electron beam and the cathode ray tube. Uh, but he suggested since atoms are neutral before these electrons are dislodged, that we must have a positive portion of the atom. Now, he didn't fully understand where this positive charge was coming from, but he suggested that maybe this positive charge was smeared out over the rest of the volume of the atom with these negatively charged electrons embedded in this material. Uh, so this is where he developed the plum pudding model of the atom. Uh, with respect to the plum pudding model of the atom, I suppose this was probably his favorite dessert at the time period. And he suggested that the pudding was like this positive charge and the plums were the electrons that were embedded in it. How many of you have ever eaten plum pudding? Have any of you have ever eaten plum pudding? It's not so popular here in the U.S., is it? Well, if you haven't eaten plum pudding, maybe we can rename this model just to help us visualize it a little better. So perhaps if J.J. Thompson had been doing these studies today, uh, maybe one of his favorite uh, sweet snacks might be a chocolate chip muffin. So you can imagine if that were the case, well, all this positive charge would be the muffin, and then the chocolate chips would be the electrons that were embedded in it. And if that were the case, he might have ended up calling it uh, the chocolate chip muffin theory model of the atom. Uh, but no, he liked plum pudding, so he thought about plums in the pudding. So that's what we were looking at with the discovery of the electron. But uh, that didn't completely match our modern theories of the atoms. We're going to determine that there's a little more information about where that positive charge is. It's not actually smeared out over the whole volume of the atom, as we'll see in a moment. So let's consider how the charge and mass of the electron were determined. Now, some of the original studies led us to understand that the electron was very low in mass. Uh, but it wasn't until 1909 when Robert Millikan ran what he called the oil droplet experiment that we begin to understand that um, the charge on an electron could actually be calculated. I would like you to watch this YouTube video if we can take a minute to pause our recording today and watch the YouTube video that shows you uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment. That would be great. So if you want to pause right here, go for it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that oil droplet 
experiment. Uh, basically, in, in Millikan's oil drop experiment, he had a nebulizer that was producing very fine droplets of oil inside of uh, the oil drop experiment uh, equipment. Now, that nebulizer produced these very fine oil droplets, and he had an X-ray source that was dislodging electrons. So that X resource was dislodging electrons from the oil droplets and causing them to be charged particles that were positive. Uh, and, and so as that was occurring, he had a voltage applied between two plates. And as the oil droplets were falling, he could control the voltage until some of the oil droplets would fall slower, and some of them would be attracted to the upper plate and start to rise, and then some would hover in place. So he could go ahead and control the voltages till he could find the smallest increments of charge that would, might have differed with respect to different oil droplets. And he was able to calculate that the charge of a single electron was 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulomb. Coulombs. Now, a coulomb is a unit of charge that's used in physics uh, that can also be related to electrochemical reactions that we'll cover later in the course. Uh, but as we can see, the, a single electron has a very small charge to a power of the negative 19th. So to really understand that, if you move the decimal point from the scientific notation number over to the left 19 times, you would see just how small that charge is on a single electron. So he was able to determine that by using uh, the oil drop experiment. So that gave us that information. Uh, the next thing that we needed to understand further is this positive charge portion of the atom. So the positive charge portion of the atom, uh, we determine more about that as Ernest Rutherford ran what we call the gold foil experiment. Okay, So we started to learn about what we call the nucleus of the atom with this experiment. Now, if you'd like to pause the video and watch the YouTube clip here about the gold foil experiment, you can see how we designed it. So go ahead and do that if you would like. Okay, so if you've watched the YouTube video, you saw that Ernest Rutherford's laboratory was using a source of alpha particles, a radioactive source, and these alpha particles were much more massive than the mass of the electrons that had been determined before this point in time. So the electrons that we had determined the mass of before this time were about 1 1800th the mass of a hydrogen atom, and the hydrogen atoms were the smallest mass atoms on the periodic table, right? So if the electron is 1 1800th the mass of a hydrogen atom, they have very little mass at all. And they knew alpha particles mass. They were positively charged particles. They knew the alpha particles, which we know today is actually a helium nucleus that has been stripped of its electrons. Uh, but the alpha particles were much more massive uh, than the mass of a single electron, about 7,300 times the mass of a single electron. So these are really massive particles. To help you visualize this, imagine your electron is like a little tiny insect and your alpha particles like a big semi-truck going down the freeway. Now if you're going to go ahead and have uh, a semi-truck like this alpha particle hitting an electron, which is like your insect, well then what's going to happen? Which moves out of the way? Is it going to be the insect ends up being squished or knocked out of the way, or is it going to be the truck that's going to be knocked to the side? Well, I'm hoping you're going to predict the insect with its very low mass is going to lose in this contest, right? It's going to be knocked to the side uh, by the high mass of, this, of the semi-truck, or the alpha particle in this case. So the reason I'm looking at this is because Ernest Rutherford actually took gold foil. Now, there was a reason he used gold foil. He, you can go ahead and produce very thin portions of it, which they can use in artwork if you go to uh, different... Uh, art supply stores, you can go ahead and find thin foils of some metals like gold or copper, and they can produce them in very, very thin layers, which makes sense because metals are quite malleable. And so they, they produced this very thin gold foil for this experiment that they suspected were only a few atoms thick because of how thin it was. The alpha particles they thought would go right through the gold foil and Ernest Rutherford suggested this would be like shooting a mortar shell okay, from a, a gun. So you had your mortar that was shooting this mortar shell. He suggested that the gold foil, if it all it has is the mass is these very, very low mass electrons making up the atoms, that the alpha particles should go right on through. 
basically like the mortar shell ripping through tissue paper. So that's what he suggested. So as any good, uh, well-known scientist might do, he's, he had his research assistants and his grad students go ahead and run this experiment. And when they ran the experiment and they shot the alpha particles at the gold foil, they had a fluorescent screen so they could see where the alpha particles would hit. Now, if it had really been as Ernest Rutherford has predicted, we predicted that all of the alpha particles would strike on the opposite side of the gold foil. And in fact, most of them did do that. Most of the alpha particles did strike the opposite side of the of the uh, foil on the fluorescent screen. So his prediction was right most of the time, but not all of the time. And so the results of this experiment when they came back to talk to uh, Rutherford was that a few of the particles were being deflected at very large angles or being deflected almost directly back at the source. Now, this seemed very strange. And the way Ernest Rutherford suggested it is this is like you shot that mortar shell at the tissue paper, and once in a while, the mortar shell would bounce back at you. That seems ludicrous, doesn't it? That's because he suggested the electrons are such low mass. Well, how could they make the mortar shell bounce back towards them, or the alpha particle that he was using bounce back towards the source? Can you imagine if this were the case with our analogy with the uh, semi-truck and the small insect? Can you imagine going down the freeway and every once in a while they just happen to hit an insect and you start bouncing off the road? That would be very disconcerting with respect to our model of how the world works. Now, at first, Rutherford wasn't sure about these results, so he went ahead and set, sent his lab assistants back to the lab and he said, try this again. They tried it again. They had the same type of results. These particles were being deflected at very broad angles or sometimes back at the source, but most of them went through. So this suggested to Rutherford that perhaps most of the atom had very little mass, which is why most of the alpha particles went right through the uh, gold foil, just like we would have predicted if there wasn't much mass to them. But every once in a while, one of the alpha particles would approach a very small portion of the atom, which he called the nucleus. And as it approached this very small portion of the atom, that nucleus, it would end up either deflecting or bouncing back at the source. So his model of the atom, which we call the nuclear model of the atom, suggests that there was a lot of mass in the center of the atoms. And he suggested that if this were uh, consisting of small particles, which he called protons, that are positively charged, well, if this very small volume was positively charged, then it would deflect the positively charged alpha particles, which explains some of the deflections they were observing. Uh, but if an alpha particle struck this very high mass nucleus, much more massive than the electrons, it could potentially reflect nearly back at the source. Okay, and so that's where he suggests the nuclear model. But this only fits if the nucleus is very, very small in size compared to the entire volume of the atom, which is why most of the alpha particles went right on through the gold foil. Now, it wasn't until quite a few years later, and you can watch this video about the gold foil experiment if you'd like, uh, it wasn't until quite a few years later that James Chadwick ran some experiments where they, where they determined that there are also neutral particles in the nucleus. And they determined they were there because they could produce a form of radiation that we now call neutron radiation, where they were dislodging these massive neutrons from the nucleus. And those neutrons wouldn't deflect in a magnetic field, indicating they weren't charged. They were neutral. And that's where the name come, came from for neutrons. If you'd like to watch a little bit more information about the discovery of subatomic particles, including uh, the electron, protons, and neutrons, there's a nice YouTube video link here. I'd like you to do that for part of your homework today. Okay, But to get back to the subatomic particles that our experiments uh, have discovered, we have electrons that were discovered discovered by J.J. Thompson's cathode ray experiment, and their charge and mass were determined by the oil drop experiments by Millikan. And then the gold foil experiment by Ernest Rutherford allowed us to develop a nuclear model of the atom where we have a very small core to the atom, a very small nucleus that has the majority of the mass. And he determined it was positively charged and consisted of what he called protons. Then it was James Chadwick that determined that there was additional mass that was unaccounted for with respect to the number of electrons and protons in the atom, and it must consist of these neutral particles that he was studying called neutrons, and they would also be located in the nucleus, which is why, again, in the gold foil experiment, most of the alpha particles went right on through the atom because that mass, 
of the atom, the majority of it existed in the nucleus in the form of protons and neutrons. So both the protons and neutrons were identified as being present in the nucleus of atoms. So if we look at the size of a nucleus versus an atom, well atoms, as I said before, are tenths of the nanometer. So a tenth of a nanometer is one times ten to the negative tenth meters, right? One order of magnitude less than a nanometer was, which was to the negative ninth. Uh, if we look at a nucleus, well, it's four orders of magnitude smaller. It's about 1 times 10 to the negative 14th meters. Now, many of you may not be comfortable yet with scientific notation because we haven't been using it very much yet in this course, but we will use quite a bit of it coming up soon in the next two chapters. Uh, but I would like to consider you to consider how small this is. Okay, so if the nucleus of an atom was about one centimeter across, well, then the atom would be about 1,000 meters or one kilometer across. Okay, now to help you visualize this, imagine you had a little tiny flea. That flea could be a nucleus in the volume of atom, atom that would be about the size of a sports stadium. Does that really give you an idea just how small this nucleus is that has most of the mass of the atom? Hopefully that helps you understand why most of the alpha particles in the gold foil experiment went right on through because most of them missed that little tiny flea in the sports stadium and only the ones that were to get very close to it would deflect or if they hit it might deflect back to the source. Okay, so there's our basic model of the atom. I want you to remember though, the electrons are found outside the nucleus in the rest of the volume of the atom. And within the nucleus, we have our protons and our neutrons, and they consist of most of the mass, whereas the electrons have very little mass to them. So remember, protons determine the identity of an atom or an element. In fact, if I look at the periodic table, so go ahead and open your book, uh, look at the periodic table, the number above each element on the periodic table is the number of protons in its nucleus. We call this the atomic number. So every different element has a unique number of protons in its nucleus which determines its atomic number and determines its position on the modern periodic table. Okay, You should realize that in elements the protons along with the neutrons determine the mass of an atom of that element and since the protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged, the, the protons and electrons determine the charge of the atom. If I have an equal number of protons as the number of electrons in the atom, I have a neutral atom. If I were to have uh, too few electrons in there, I start to have a positively charged ion that we'll call a cation. If I were to have uh, extra electrons in the atom beyond the number of protons I have, then I would have a negatively charged ion called an anion. Okay, so just be aware of that. My neutrons are also located in the nucleus, and together with the protons, they help you determine the mass of the atom. So almost all of the mass comes from protons and neutrons in our atoms. Very little of the mass comes from many of the, the electrons, because they contribute just a very very small amount, much smaller than either the protons or the neutrons, which are close in mass to one another. Now the electrons, together with the protons, as I said before, determine charge. The neutrons don't help determine any of the charge of the atom because, as their name implies, they're neutral, which is why they were so hard to observe to begin with because of their neutral charge. Okay, They did not deflect in a magnetic field. They couldn't be studied in the same ways as the electrons or, or the protons. Now, you should be aware that electrons, since they're on the outsides of the atoms, it's just like if you were walking down the street and you bumped into somebody, you bump into their outside, right? You're going to bump into their elbow or their shoulder. You're not going to bump into uh, their lungs or their spleen, which is on the inside. So when atoms bump into one another, they don't bump into the nuclei of one another. They bump into the outsides of the atoms, which is where the electrons are. So as atoms do bumping and are involved in chemical reactions, what happens in chemical reactions is you tend to either shear the electrons on the outsides of the atoms, such as what nonmetals will do to form molecules, or sometimes you transfer those outer electrons during collisions and chemical processes from one atom to another to form ions. Some of the atoms end up with extra electrons and are negatively charged, we call those anions, and some of the atoms end up uh, losing electrons, becoming positively charged, and we call those cations. 
okay? The protons and the neutrons are not transferred in a chemical reaction. The only time we would expect changes in the nucleus would be during a nuclear process, which involves much larger amounts of energy. In the chemistry laboratory for this course, we're going to be focusing on chemical reactions involving the outer electrons. Only in the one chapter in our textbook that deals with nuclear processes will we talk about changes in the nucleus. So if I consider all the properties of my protons, electrons, and neutrons, well, if I look at the mass of a proton, it's 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. Now, that doesn't look like very much, but compare it to the mass of an electron. An electron is 0 0.0009 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So you can you see that it's about four orders of magnitude, one, two, three, four, smaller a mass, roughly. Okay, if we look at a neutron, its mass to three significant figures or to two decimal places is virtually identical to that of a proton. Now, so we don't have to deal with the large numbers, the large negative numbers, and the scientific notation for the mass of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and grams. So we're going to simplify this for our discussion. So hopefully this will make this much easier as we discuss the number of subatomic particles and the mass of the particles that we're looking at. Uh, by not dealing with gram quantities, we're going to use a unit called the atomic mass unit. Now, atomic mass units are about one-twelfth the mass of a carbon carbon-12 isotope. We'll talk more about isotopes here next time, uh, but we're going to treat these as AMU units, these atomic mass units. I'm going to treat a proton's mass as 1, and since the mass of a neutron is virtually identical, I'm going to treat its mass as 1 atomic mass unit. Now we're going to lie a little bit for simplicity's sake and treat the electron mass as if it's 0. What we really mean here is the mass of an electron is much, 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 much smaller than the mass of the protons or the neutrons. So I'm going to treat the mass of an electron is approximately zero for its mass for atomic mass units as I'm looking at them and determining masses of atoms. Okay. Now remember the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus of the atoms in the center in that very small volume. That's like the, the little tiny flea in the center of the uh, baseball stadium. Very tiny volume of the nucleus but almost all the mass is there. Now, outside of the nucleus and the rest of the volume and the periphery of the atom is going to be where the electrons are located. Okay. Now, you should remember the charges in all the particles. The protons are positive. So protons, that P at the beginning, will help you remember that they're positive for their charge. The electrons are negative for their charge. And neutrons, as their name implies, are neutral. Okay. Now, our symbols for each of these subatomic particles, sometimes we'll just write a P for protons, an E for electrons, and an N for neutrons. But you're going to see in chemistry classes, when we start looking at particles or atoms that have charges on them, which we'll call ions, we usually show that charge in the upper right-hand superscript. So I can show a proton as having a positive charge. If I just write a plus sign, that means it's a positive 1. Uh, electrons will be a negative charge. We're going to put that as a negative 1. Now, you notice we're not using Coulomb for the charges here. We're just going to treat protons as a plus one, electrons as a negative one to keep things simple. And we're going to say the neutrons are zero for charge, so a lot of the time we won't even bother to write the charge in the upper right hand superscript as zero. We'll just write the n and remember it's neutral, so we didn't have to really remember that. Now here's something strange. Sometimes you'll see the symbol for a proton written as H+. Plus. Hmm, why would I show the elemental symbol for hydrogen in a positive sign? Well, look at your periodic table. What's the atomic number for hydrogen? What's the number above the symbol for hydrogen on the periodic table? If you look closely, you'll see it's a 1, right, for the atomic number. How does that relate to numbers of protons in its nucleus? Yes, that's right. That atomic number is the same as the number of protons. It determines the identity of the element. So there's one proton in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Now, most hydrogen atoms that are present in nature, but not all of them, but most of them have a mass of about one atomic mass unit. Now the only way that would be possible for most hydrogen atoms to have a mass of one atomic mass unit is if they had a proton in the nucleus and nothing else in the nucleus. Because if they were to have a neutron in the nucleus, we would have a mass of two atomic mass units. You can get a idea about this by looking at the relative atomic mass underneath hydrogen on the periodic table, which is close to the whole number 1. The reason it isn't exactly 1 is because there are a few atoms in nature of hydrogen that may have some neutrons in the nucleus, 1 or 2. Those would be deuterium or tritium atoms, 
okay, and they're called isotopes. But most of the hydrogen atoms have only the proton in the nucleus and no neutrons. Now, if I were to form a positively one charged cation by stripping the one electron that I would need in a hydrogen atom for it to be neutral, because if it's a neutral atom, I just need the same number of electrons as protons, so I'd have one of each. If I were to lose one electron, then all that would be left behind in the most common atoms of hydrogen would just be a proton. So a hydrogen cation is usually just identical to a proton because you've left that bare nucleus with the one subatomic particle in it, that one proton present. So that's why you'll sometimes see that used interchangeably here. Okay. Now let's consider the element of carbon on the periodic table. Let's look at the subatomic. Uh, let's look at carbon subatomic particles. If we look on the periodic table for carbon, the atomic number for carbon, if we look above it, is a 6. So look in your periodic table, convince yourself it's a 6. That tells me that there should be 6 protons in every carbon atom in nature. Right? The identity of the carbon atom is determined by the number of protons in its nucleus, which is 6. If we wanted to determine in a neutral carbon atom how many electrons are present, if it's neutral, we should also have six. Six of six positive charges, six negative charges adds up to zero overall in charge, so it's neutral. Now, however, the number of neutrons, so if I consider the number of neutrons in a carbon atom, well, they can vary. We can have a variety of uh, different carbon atoms that have different numbers of neutrons in its nucleus, and these are called isotopes. Okay, so if I had uh, six neutrons in my nucleus, well, the carbon would have an atomic mass of 12. It would have six protons plus six neutrons, add those up, it'd be 12. But some carbon atoms have seven neutrons. And so that would have six protons plus seven neutrons. It would have a mass of 13. Okay, if we look on the periodic table, the relative atomic mass underneath carbon is close to 12, but it's just a little bit bigger. It indicates that in nature there are some isotopes of carbon that have more than six neutrons in their nucleus. So we're seeing slightly higher averages in nature with respect to having a bulk sample with many carbon atoms present. Now, if we vary the number of electrons in an atom, if they're not always the same as the number of protons present, well, then we start to have a charge species for that atom that we'll call an ion. If there's more electrons than the number of protons in the nucleus, it becomes a negatively charged ion because I would have more than the number of positive charges in that nucleus from the protons due to the excess of the electrons. So I would call that an anion a negative ion you can imagine. You can think about the N in the name anion as a negative ion. If you had too few electrons and more protons than the number of electrons, we would have a positive charge overall and we would say that that ion was positively charged and we would call it a cation. You can always remember cations are positively charged because think of the T in their name for cation. The T is like a plus symbol for a positively charged ion in a sense. That's a little mnemonic device that might help you out. Now, let's think about how to write a symbol for an element. If I'm noting it in a textbook or on my piece of paper for an exam, I'm going to go ahead and show the symbol of an element uh, as the first part of writing uh, down information about my subatomic particles. I'm going to put an X down for the symbol of my element. So first of all, this et shown here would be whatever element symbol I was looking at. So if I was looking at carbon, I'd put a capital C here. If I was looking at hydrogen, I'd put a capital H. Okay. The next thing we'll look at is the Z. The Z in my atomic symbol here. The Z will be my atomic number. That's the same as the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, when I look at my periodic table, where is my atomic number? It's above the element symbol, isn't it? So it's above the element symbol. So my atomic number uh, for carbon would be 6. For hydrogen would be 1. For nitrogen, it would be 7. And for oxygen, it would be 8. It's the number above. So that would be my atomic number. I'm sure that as a Z. You show your atomic number as a lower left-hand subscript before the element symbol, if I show it at all. Now the capital A here, so that's my atomic number, the capital A 
Whoops, I almost forgot to mention. Remember the number of protons in the nucleus would have to be equal to the number of electrons I have present in a neutral atom. So if I have uh, a carbon atom with six protons in its nucleus, if it's a neutral atom and not an ion, I should have six electrons to balance charge to have zero charge overall. Uh, if we consider the capital A here, that is my mass number, my mass number. My, my, my mass number is coming from the protons and the neutrons. We're ignoring the electrons because of the very low mass of electrons in comparison to the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. So my mass number will be the sum of my atomic number Z, the number of protons, and my number of neutrons that must be present. Okay, so if I know my mass number and my atomic number, I could always subtract my atomic number Z from the mass number A, and the difference would be the number of neutrons that make up the additional mass. Okay, so it's going to be very simple to calculate these. Now remember, if I have an isotope, the atomic number is not different. If the atomic number were different, I would have a different element. Remember, the identity of the element, if it's determined by the number of protons, is determined by the atomic number. So isotopes would have the same atomic number if they were isotopes of the same element, and but they would differ by mass number because their numbers of neutrons would vary. So isotopes vary based on numbers of neutrons in their nuclei. Okay. So let's look at the following isotope. I gave you a little bit of information. Uh, it has seven electrons present, and we're showing the the neutrons as red spheres and the protons as blue spheres with a positive white charge here in the nucleus. So we've expanded the nucleus so it's a little easier to see the particles present in it. If we look at that nucleus and we want to determine how many protons and neutrons we have, it should be pretty straightforward and you're going to have a few homework problems like this. So let's practice it. If you'd like to, you can pause the video and then try to answer the multiple choice questions I have here. Try to pick which is the right answer. Once you've determined your answer, compare with your neighbor. See if you're getting the same answer. Make sure you're talking about chemistry here. Uh, if we're looking at the number of subatomic particles here, well, we can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven of my protons. So what element is this, by the way? If I have seven protons, what element is it? I want you to think about that for just a minute. We're going to come back to that. So I have seven protons. So my answer should be either A or E. And let's count the number of neutrons. They're the red particles. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six neutrons. Okay. So the correct answer would be E. If you had picked 13, you were confusing the number of neutrons with your mass number for the atom, which would be the sum of the protons and neutrons. That would be six plus seven, right? The six neutrons plus the seven protons would give me my atom my atomic mass. Okay, my mass number. Okay. Now. If we wanted to identify this element, I asked you to think about which element we had. Which subatomic particle helps you determine the type of element you have? Remember, your atomic number is determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. Okay, so if I have seven protons, as we already counted for this atom, that would match the atomic number of seven. If you look on your periodic table, the element with an atomic number of seven, your Z, which is your atomic number, is nitrogen. Right, so seven protons, that must be nitrogen. If I ever have an atom with seven protons in the nucleus, it must always be a nitrogen atom. If it has a different mass number, it would have to be an isotope of nitrogen, and that would have different numbers of neutrons if that were the case. Okay. So the mass number for this isotope, as we said before, it results from having the seven protons that we counted and the six neutrons. If we add those up, we get a total of 13, 6 plus 7. That would be my uh, atomic mass. So my mass number would be 13. That's my mass number for my this isotope of this atom. OK, so that's what we've been looking at. So hopefully we can determine pretty readily by looking at uh, my atomic uh, symbol here. Looking at the mass number, I should be able to determine how many neutrons and protons I have based on the atomic number. And I can always determine the number of electrons because my number of electrons, if it's a neutral atom, would be identical to the, uh, to the element's uh, 
my atomic number on the periodic table. So I always have my atomic number from the periodic table even if I don't write it here. So sometimes you'll see a symbol without the atomic number. I looked at the periodic table, that helps me determine which one it is and the number of protons. Now if I subtract the atomic number from the mass number, the difference would be the number of neutrons present. Okay, so here's a few questions for you. So, so some review questions here today. Uh, if the number of protons in the nucleus differed, what would happen to an atom's identity if I were to have a different number of protons in its nucleus? Now the atomic number is the same as my number of protons in the nucleus. So if I were to change my number of protons in the nucleus, it would be a different element. That might occur, let's say, in a nuclear process. It won't occur in chemical reactions. We leave the nucleus alone in chemical reactions and it doesn't change the number of protons. Okay, so I don't expect the number of uh, protons in the nucleus to ever change it in, in a chemical reaction, so the element identity shouldn't change. That's going to really help me with conservation of mass, where I have the same number of every type of atom before and after a chemical reaction. But remember, number of protons in the nucleus would only differ if I had a different element that I was then talking about. Now, what would happen if I had a different number of neutrons in the nucleus? What would that do for me if I had a different number of neutrons in the nucleus? Now, that would be the same element if the protons didn't change. So I give that a special name. I say if I have the same number of protons in these two atoms' nuclei, but I change the number of neutrons, well, the different number of neutrons would result in different isotopes. So different numbers of neutrons in the nuclei of the same element would give me different isotopes of that element. Okay, so let's look at some isotope symbols for elements and see if we can determine the subatomic particles present. So this is something good to quiz yourself at home if you run out of time today looking at these. Quiz yourself about the uh, number of subatomic particles present that we know from each symbol. So my element here is carbon. I know that from the capital C. The mass number is 14. The atomic number is 6. So if you want to, you can pause the video, answer this question, compare with your neighbor, and then you can start it again. Okay, so my atomic number is a 6. So if my atomic number is a 6, that should be identical to my number above my element on the periodic table is identical to the number of protons I have present. So I know what my answer to this question must either be C or D. I have six protons. Now, how many electrons do I have? If I look at the upper right hand superscript of the element, if nothing is shown there, we assume it's a zero. It's neutral overall. Now we know there's six positive protons, so the only way that the carbon atom here can be neutral is if there's also six negative electrons. So I have a plus six and a negative six adds up to zero. So overall my charge is neutral, is zero. So that means D would be a <coughs> possible correct answer, or C would be a possible correct answer because there's six protons and six electrons. So the, what we have to rely on is determining how many numbers of neutrons are here. If you had put D as your answer, well, that would be my mass number. But remember, my mass number is the sum of my protons and my neutrons. So if I want to find my number of neutrons, I need to take my atomic number, my number of protons, and subtract it from the mass number. I'm ignoring electrons because they're not contributing a significant amount of mass. So I subtract 6 from 14, and I get an 8. So the number of neutrons are 8. So you had the right answer if you picked C. Okay, so let's look at our next one. Here we have a carbon atom, and it still has the same atomic number. So it still has 6 protons. So again, we're looking at an answer of either C or D. Right? Go ahead and pause this if you're thinking about it. Uh, if, if we look at it, though, the mass number differs. If I have a different mass number, what does that tell me about this atom? It would be an isotope, right? So we have a different isotope of carbon we're looking at. So if we're looking at carbon 11, well then I can determine the number of neutrons by subtracting my atomic number, 6, my number of protons from my mass number of 11. That would give me 5. That means there's 5 neutrons contributing to mass in this isotope that I'm looking at. The number of electrons, since I have a neutral atom still, there's no charge shown in the upper right-hand superscript, so we assume it's zero. I must have the same number of electrons as number of protons, so it would be six and six. We just determined it's five neutrons, so D would be the right answer. 
C would be incorrect because you're confusing your mass number with the number of neutrons, and the mass number comes from the sum of numbers of protons plus numbers of neutrons. So if I take 6 protons plus 5 neutrons, I get a mass number of 11, which is where this 11 is coming from, and my isotope symbol. If we consider chlorine uh, 35, chlorine 35 has a mass number of 35. If, if I look on the periodic table, it has an atomic number of 17. I'm, that's shown as my lower left-hand subscript. Okay, so I'm looking at this. Pause the video if you'd like to, to answer this question. If I look at all of the different choices here, the only the ones that have 17 for the numbers of protons, that would be B and C would make sense. The atomic number is my number of protons that determines the identity of this element as chlorine. Okay. Now my mass number is 35, but that's the sum of my number of protons plus my numbers of neutrons. So if I go ahead and subtract 17, from 35, then our difference here would tell me my numbers of neutrons present. So that would have given me 18 neutrons. And since it's neutral, there's no charge shown in the upper right-hand superscript, we know that we would have the same number of electrons as the number of protons in order to be a neutral atom. So the only correct answer here would be 17 protons, 18 neutrons, and 17 electrons. Remember, my mass number comes from 17 plus 18 to give me 35. Okay, so I'm going to have an additional video that's present on YouTube that will show you some more examples of these types of calculations. Uh, I want you to practice them. Pause the video. See if you can pick the right multiple choice answer and determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You'll have to do that on your first exam as well as in your homework. So continue practicing writing these symbols and determining the number of subatomic particles from those symbols. Thank you.